Good morning, folks. Welcome. Welcome to the nice, fresh ambience and fresh air feeling you've got in this room. And I can say something about there being lots of hot air in the room before anyone said anything yet. So it's, it's, uh, the air conditioning's on full glass, so apparently it will feel a bit nicer. Can you people to open the windows? We can't. It's the joy. Of, I was asked why can't you open the window, which is a very sensible question. The joy of modern uh, shared service office spaces. So. We can't uh, so we we'll, we'll, we'll wait for the air conditioning to do, to do its bit. But anyway, uh, with that out of the way, I'm Gavin Kelly. I, I run the Resolution <laughs> Foundation, and thanks to all of you for coming. It's it's great to see so many of you here. Um, you almost think there's an election coming up or something. Uh, <laughs> levels of interest. I think we may have people joining us in the Uber Skill Room upstairs. So, if so, welcome to you too. Um, today's event is uh, today's work is tomorrow's retirement problem. Uh, and we've got a keynote speaker who everyone in this room will know, Steve Webb, Pension Minister, Keep it down voice on these issues. And we've got a fantastic panel of speakers, and we've also got a great chair in Becky Barrow uh, for some uh, times, the money editor, uh, which means that my job is an easy one. I just have to say hello. And I'm just going to give you a couple of points from me um, before I hand over to the real experts. Um, the first thing I want to do is start off a positive. Um, sometimes because of the state of the economy and the state of the plight of the people that we worry about most, the resolution foundation, we don't do that. But I want to start with a positive because <coughs> I know, I'm sure we're going to hear a fair bit about one of the main pensions policies that's been around at the moment, which is also enrolment. Um, and I, I very strongly think that it's a policy whose heart is in the right place that's going to benefit um, millions of working people in this country. But it's also a policy that's been successfully rolled out on time, roughly speaking, to a sensible timetable. Um, it hasn't been overhyped by the politicians who are leaving on it. Um, and it's basically been built out of consensus and after a long-term process of policy development. Now, that, that set of remarks is not a set of remarks, I have to confess to Steve, that I will be making about most of the policies that come out of his department over the last five years. But it is exactly, I think, a, a, an accurate description of how Steve has approached auto enrolment. So all more credit to him for that. Uh, it's an important thing that we recognise um, progress when we see it, and I think auto enrolment is definitely progress. We have worries about that particular policy in terms of some of the groups that it doesn't serve, as well as it possibly might, so that we have various things that we want to talk and debate, and I'm sure that will come up today. Um, but it's, it's a big advance. Uh, so that's my first point. My second point is that even with this progress, uh, let's be clear-eyed about the daunting challenge that we all face in terms of people, particularly from low middle income households, saving for their pensions. <laughs> and I won't rattle through lots of statistics because most of the folk in this room probably know it, but we have a massive challenge on our hands, um, even with a sensible policy framework that's being put in place. We're about to do a report, for instance, on the pensions position of the UK's four and a half million or so self-employed workers. Um, to say it's bleak reading really doesn't get close to it. It's an absolute, it's a horror story, to be honest. Um, and there are others I could go, go to, and auto enrolment isn't really designed to fix that problem. So we have a lot of work to do, let's be clear about that. And my third point, really, just to finish on, is a more of a political one, which is sort of building on the last two. We know we're about to face a, uh, we are already in a long election campaign. We know that there'll be a lot of chat about the position of pensioners vis-a-vis -vis other groups, that's going to be one of the kind of recurring themes of it. Um, it'll be a rather crude sort of debate, I fear, on that front. I just hope 
I really do hope, and we'll do our best to try and make this happen, that we have some proper focus on the plight of today's low paid workers in relation to their future retirement savings um, and their future retirement uh, adequacy. Uh, because, as I say, we have a big challenge in this country, and not enough people are talking about it. And it's high time that we have an honest, open political debate about how best to support today's low paid workers in terms of their future needs. And with that, I will hand over to you, Becky. Thank you. Hello, everybody. As um, Gavin <coughs> said, I'm Becky Barrow. I have recently joined the Sunday Times, edit the money section, um, and I'm joined by a wonderful panel of experts. Um, everybody knows Steve Webb, who is our longest serving pensions minister, for certainly as long as I can remember. I think the figures were 10 previous pensions ministers in the previous decade. <coughs> He's brought a great consistency to the job, for which um, we are grateful. Um, Chris Curry, on my left, is from the Pensions Policy Institute, <coughs> a provider of fantastic research on pensions, um, which was the source of many, many excellent stories and will continue to be. Um, Graham Vidler recently joined the National Association of Pension Funds, formerly at NEST, so one of the um, people who led the launch of NEST, where he worked for until March last year. Um, and Nigel Stanley from the Trade Union Congress, um, who is currently head of campaigns and a secret pensions expert, but not a secret if you read his blog. <laughs> <laughs> so Steve's going to go first. Um, from there, from there. Uh, Gavin, Becky, thank you very much. Good morning to all of you. Thank you for um, spending a little bit of time in a very hot room uh, to talk about pensions. Um, actually, I, I, I was sitting upstairs getting ready and my, my phone went and I thought it was, it was probably the departmental press office telling me to just stay on message. Um, in fact, I didn't bring a departmental press officer with me this morning, so I mean not. Um, but actually, I got, I got a text and I thought, oh, that's good. You know, it could be the family, my daughter asking for money or something. And, um, <laughs> actually, it says, um, it's from 07104090903. It says, if you have a frozen pension <laughs> and prior to 55, you are now entitled to a free review. Please call back and so on. So, um, <laughs> should I do that? No, I'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, no, um, we were delighted. I mean, when I, when I heard that, that today was sold out, I thought oh, that was great. And I, I'm, you know, grateful to the amount that you paid your tickets today. <laughs> Shows the level of commitment. And um, I guess you're here because you want to know what the next government is going to do on pensions. And I suppose that kind of depends on on, on my successor, whoever he, she, or I may be. Um, but I guess um, I thought I'd give you a flavour of where where I think we ought to be going on all of this. So I suppose my starting point is that pensions is the most gripping subject in government. Okay. Now, I know you know that, because uh, you wouldn't be here otherwise, but not everybody has quite got that. Now, why is, it, why is it so interesting? Because your pension outcome depends on every aspect of your life. It depends on your life expectancy. It depends on your level of education. It depends on what sort of job you do, what your career path is, what sort of firm you work for. Depends on whether you're single or married or divorced. It depends on everything. So everything affects pensions. And that's what makes it so it, unendingly fascinating to me, and, and I know to you, is that to get pensions policy right, you can't just think about pensions. You've got to think broadly. But what do we do in government? Now, I'm going to invent a, a, a word here. Now, just to explain, I don't know, who ever played words with friends? Anyone? Yeah, one, two, nodding, those of you. Um, who have spare time. Um, and uh, I play regularly with my wife, and she, she invents seven letter words all the time. Okay. So I'm going to invent a seven letter word here, which is silo eyes. Okay. And I shall be using it later on in Words with Friends. Um, we, we in government, we silo eyes. We don't see people, we see policies. So I do pensions. But actually, I don't. I do bits of pensions. <coughs> so if you want to write to the government about pensions, you have to write about state pensions. Yeah. That's it. Write about your workplace pension. Oh, well, that kind of depends. Is it, is it a trust-based workplace pension regulated by the pensions regulator? Yeah, that's me. Or is it a group personal pension under the auspices of the Financial Conduct Authority? No, that's, that's somebody else. Or you're thinking about um, savings. <coughs> so that, that would obviously be the pension, wouldn't it? Well, short-term savings is the Treasury. 
Financial inclusion is sort of us, a bit of DWP, a bit of credit unions and so on, but these are people <coughs> interested in doorstep lenders and so on. And you start to see how fragmented all of these things are. It's like pension company again, obviously, it's desperate to get all of it. Um, and um, think about something else. Think about your needs in retirement. We focus on income needs, but what about care needs? And what about the overlap between the two? Because presumably you need resources in retirement to live off and you need resources in retirement to live <coughs> care needs potentially. Do we have an integrated financial product for care and for pensions yet? <coughs> not in any meaningful way. Why not? Well, partly because we siloize. You can see the point there. So what do we what do we do about that? We put it all in one place. This isn't, there might be the cynics amongst you might think this is a bit of a land grab. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> um, but why don't we have, for example, a department for pensions and the ageing society? So you could, as it were, take the P from the DWP. Uh, you could deal with pensions, but not just DWP bits of pensions. You could deal with treasury bits of pensions. I heard something from Oscar after that, just no <laughs> objection there. But, um, uh, but what about long term care? What about long term saving? What about doing all these things in, in one place and actually seeing the person, not the policy areas? And what sort of things would that, would that lead us to think about? It would lead us to think about what happens to you in retirement based on that whole list of things I mentioned earlier that affect your outcomes. So we would think about how the labour market affects what happens in retirement. And um, Gavin mentioned the position of the self-employed, and I absolutely agree with that, you know, that, that what I would call the new self-employed. I think the old self-employed, broadly, you know, my pensions, my business kind of thing, many of them do okay. But the new self-employed, who in a previous era would have been employed, <coughs> we have a real problem with. Now, um, one thing we have done is we've changed the state pension system. So whereas you used to have a kind of lousy basic state pension, that even we don't think he's enough to live on, and then an earnings related second bit that self employed weren't in, so the self employed were only ever building up 113 quid a week, and then hopefully something else. We've effectively <coughs> put self employed into the second bit of the state pension by abolishing it. <coughs> if you see what I mean. So rather than have a first bit and then a second bit the self employed aren't in, we just have a bit, we just have a pension, and self employed are fully members, and in a sense, there is a windfall. There aren't many cliff edgy type windfalls in the new state pension, but the self-employed are one of them. And so they will get a windfall gain from the new state pension. They're relatively low levels of plus two much insurance, uh, which they paid in the past, will buy them quite a worthwhile state pension. And this only gets them to the starting gate, the starting line. You know, I don't want to retire on seven or eight thousand pounds a year. That's where it will get them to. But it is a start. It's the first time actually a government's done something worthwhile for self-employed on pensions in living memory. Now, I remember, um, Chris will probably remember better than me, there was something called the Pensions Policy Group or something like that, I think that's what it's called, who did a report on, on pensions and self-employed over a decade ago. And when I arrived in office in 2010, I kind of found it in that corner shelf up there somewhere. Um, because nobody's got any very good answers. I mean, you talk to people like the Federation of Small Business and so on, and they say, well, the reason I'm self-employed or whatever is I don't want the government, you know, I want all the things for myself, I think that's the way I want to do things. Because I said, well, you know, would you want to be part of auto enrolment or what? It's like, no, leave us alone. But of course, that might be a particular sort of self-employed person. But what do we do at the bottom? So my question is, <clears throat> if you had a department for pension daily society or something like that, you could look holistically at labour market trends and what they mean. <laughs> you could look at social change, and I think one of the elephants in the room is divorce. We had a go. 10 or 12 years ago on pension sharing on divorce, but we've got a problem with divorce, as it were. Um, which is to say, um, we're moving to a state pension system that's deliberately based on the individual, where over time you won't get a pension based on the person you're married to's record, it's based on your own. It's better, but then it's your own and, and it stays with you. And the problem with that is if you think about the way that people's private pension income is affected by their family life. Many women, particularly, who perhaps have career breaks or take time out to have kids and go back in and having sort of missed out that promotion, just end up effectively through their family commitments and perhaps through caring in later life, damaging not their state pension, because that's now fully protected, more or less, but their private pension. 
Now, if the couple stay together into retirement, and between them, they're fine. But what if they split up in their 50s? So? Now, in theory, we have pension sharing on divorce and pension splitting and pension credits and pension debits and all the rest of it. But the reality, I think, is it doesn't work terribly well. That your average divorce lawyer and so on is focused on the house and all the rest of it. But if you've still got kids, actually, are you really going to haggle hard over a share of pension? So I, I, I worry that <clears throat> in a world where the state pension is only getting you to a basic minimum and where you know, quality retirement means having something else, that we haven't quite worked out how that works in a world where we can't assume that people have a partner to depend on all the way through, even if they've had a partner when they're at work. So I think that's an example of where thinking about social change as part of the Ministry of <coughs> uh, Pensions and Aging Society would enable us to see the whole person and to see the different bits of government in an integrated way. What about the old elderly? One of the good things about, one of the many good things about the budget freedoms is people at 55 and so on can make decisions and we'll try and give them guidance through the pension-wise service and that's great. But what assumptions are we making about their ability to make sophisticated financial decisions at 75 or 80? Because one of the issues here is that um, if there are no defaults, you make a choice initially and, and life goes by and at the point where you perhaps ought to try and do something different, maybe you're not necessarily in a position to do that. Now, I'm not saying everybody at those ages is incapable of making those decisions, but some people will be. So have we really thought through financial capability in a world where people retire for 30 years? And in a world where they have, you know, freedom and choice is great, but then what do you do for people who are not in a good position to exercise it at some point in their retirement? And again, if we, you know, we just think pensions, and my colleague Norman Lamb thinks about social care and, and the old elderly, but actually shouldn't that be joined together. And linked to that, we've got to get to the point where we fix social care funding. And it seems to me that if we can make auto enrolment work and make sure that people have um, products for retirement that give them a decent either retirement income or wealth or some mixture of the two, it ought not to be beyond the wit of man or woman to somehow bring care funding into that. Now, there's lots of ways you could do it. Uh, I have always thought that if I had a pension pot of, say, 60, I would be willing to hand over X thousand pounds to a provider so that when I'm, say, 80, if I need care, they come in and cover it to the extent that this is a financial issue not you know, family care and all the rest of it. Um, and that's not really happened yet. Now, partly that's not happened yet because the insurance industry haven't wanted to face this kind of this long tail, you know, the small number of people who have absolutely catastrophic care costs. But the deal not cap will start, you know, enables us to have a conversation, puts a, puts a limit on the exposure of the insurance industry to very, very high child costs, and means that you could imagine insurance products. Now, one of the problems here <clears throat> is it's not clear what you're insuring, because, um, you know, if you have absolutely nothing, you will get something from the state, but it will be bare minimum. It will be, if you need residential care, it will probably be the, the cheapest residential care in the authority, you know, it won't necessarily be where you would want to be. So what is it? What is it that you are insuring? Is it better quality? Is it residential care to enable, uh, sorry, care in your home, domiciliary care to enable you to stay in your own home? And I, I have been, you know, in a sense, this isn't the whole council of despair because in this parliament we have tried to join these things together. I have sat down with health ministers and the insurance industry and talked about these things. I have sat down with treasury ministers and talked about things that overlap. We've tried our best to overcome these silos but they haven't led to us getting to answers where they where issues so completely clearly overlap between departments. So what I would like to see is the ability of government to see people and their later life and retirement and their care needs and uh, the impact of social change and labour market and all of that holistically in one place. Now, um, when I floated this idea <clears throat> occasionally, people have said, well, the Treasury will never let go of the tax relief. There might be some truth in that. Um, so, so I have a wheeze. <clears throat> I have a wheeze on this, which is um, joint ministers, because at the moment, if you think about it, we have ministers who do energy and business, or my colleague David Laws is in education and cabinet office. So I see no reason, in principle, why someone in the Ministry for Pensions and the Aging Society shouldn't actually have a foot in the Treasury, and frankly, to function effectively, would need to have a foot in the Treasury to provide that bridge. So I think it's I think it's doable. 
let me go on then to some of the uh, other agenda items for the next parliament, but I do think that's the kind of the big picture. So we have a general election. <coughs> Nobody wins, don't know, really. Um, parties have to work together maybe, don't know. Um, but whoever, whoever is the pensions minister uh, in the new parliament, or Secretary of State for Pensions and the Asian Society, as, as I think of it, um, <laughs> um, we'll, we'll face carrying on from where we've started. So what sort of things, what sort of things will they have to do? Well, one of the things I've learned in my current role is how long it takes to do stuff. <laughs> Not a total revelation, I know, to those of you who are seasoned whitehall watchers, but it kind of has been a shock to me. Um, and so if you think, for example, um, excuse me a second. <coughs> um, <coughs> if you think about the um, new state pension, when I first arrived in the department, I was given, I mean, it, it, it's something I never knew happened, because you kind, of, you kind of arrive, and then you think, well, what am I, what am I actually going to do? I'm you know, here, yeah. yeah, I'll keep an eye on things, but what, what am I actually going to do? And I was given a list, <coughs> a list of kind of 20 ideas, as I recall. I wish I'd kept it, actually, because it'd be great. Um, in fact, I probably ought to track it down before I throw it out. And um, state pension reform was on the list, just so you know, flat rate state pension and so on. So I kind of looked down this, this menu without prices. And um, thought, oh yeah, I'll go state pension reform. You know, that's that's what I wanted in opposition. That's that's what we'll try and do. And that's why we've got a new state pension because it was on the list. And because it was on the list, it meant that the sort of thought about it, and there was a sort of certain element of momentum. And so we worked on that. But what did we do? We did a green paper <laughs> with a single tier and a sort of dummy option. <coughs> no, sorry, a consultation. No, a consultation uh, with new state pension and, and fast flow rating. And that went through. And then we had to have a white paper. And then we had a draft bill, and then we had a bill, and then we have rigs, and it still won't happen until 2016. And when I started, they said to me, of course, you can't do this till 2020 because the state pension age is moving. <coughs> and you couldn't possibly introduce a new state pension when you've got a moving state pension age because it would create anomalies. That's okay. Funny that there. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, the idea that we would sit down and think and we'll do it in 2020, it's like, you know, I know pensions are a long-term game, but that's two complete parliaments before anybody gets it. So, you know, and even even pushing it through pretty quickly, it took six years from uh, paying first. But the point of all of that slightly rambling account is I think the new pensions minister needs to sit down right at the start of the parliament and, and get all the dirty linen out, all the all the forward agenda, all the outstanding issues, and try and build some element of consensus, focus, and so on. And let me give you one example of where I think that's very important. Um, as Gavin said, automatic enrolment has been a triumph. And many of you in the room have been part of that. You know, getting over five million people, you know, there are not many policies where you could point to where you could say over five million people the government has put in place measures that have unambiguously benefited them. With 90% staying in, it's going to be 10 million by the time we finish, give or take. And that's fantastic. But the amounts going in are tiny at the moment. We know that, and that's why we've done it very gradually. But even when it's fully rolled out, we're only up to 8%. And whilst if you're earning 10,000 a year, an 8,000 pound state pension and 8% contribution keeps you going where you were before, if you're on 20,000, 25,000, 30,000, it doesn't. It basically doesn't. And one of our worries is people will retire soon and say, well, hang on, Mr. Weber, you set pension, you set the level of my default contributions, I did everything you told me to, and I've ended up with not enough money to live on in retirement. Why didn't you set those numbers in the right place? So I think that the first thing that the next parliament will have to address is the age. I've said that in this, unless and until we go to mandatory savings and having gone through all the agonies of opt-outs and, and voluntary savings, we've got 90% staying in. It doesn't feel like the right point to force the last of them. So if we going to go down the voluntary route, I think we have to find ways that, that go with the grain of voluntarism to get people up. And for me, the obvious way is saying um, automatic escalation is to say you join a job at 8%, and then unless you opt out, every time you get a pay rise, and, you know, there will be pay rise. I promise you. Um, every time you get a pay rise, a bit of that pay rise goes into your pension until you reach whatever level we think. And, you know, you can argue about what that level should be. You could say it should be different for older workers, younger workers. You could do it slower or faster. You know, there's a thousand permutations. But I think that has got to be the right way forward to get people as soon as we can to realistic levels. And, of course, that will take a long time to do. 
you know, you spend the first six months of Warrior Witches having this conversation. You then do a formal consultation, do lots of modelling and number crunch and all the rest of it. You then draw up draft legislation. You bid for a slot in the Queen's speech of whichever year we have nine months to get that through Parliament. You then do the regs. It ain't going to happen before 2018. And that's if you start on day one. So whoever comes in can't waste time. And if the spirit of auto enrollment has been largely consensual, <coughs> then actually let's carry on in that way. So let's, let's do that. At the same time, you've got to sort out tax relief. <coughs> now people often say, it's no way to run tax relief. Do an autumn statement. People are sitting by their you know, transistor radios or the equivalent, the modern equivalent, um, wondering if someone's going to fiddle with tax relief. That doesn't feel like a, a lot. My view is that, you know, if I want to put a pound into my pension, it costs me 60p, because the taxpayer is going to put 40p in tax relief. Someone who works in my office costs them 80p, because the taxpayer is going to give them 20p. That can't be sustainable. So rather than us just kind of fiddle around the edges of tax relief, let's do it properly. It's that we get very hung up on, oh, it, it's not tax relief at all, it's just deferred tax and all the rest of it. But we know that most of the people who get tax relief at the higher rate retire on the standard rate. So actually it's even more hard to understand why we do it the way we do. So Chris and his colleagues at the PPI have said that if you just wanted to do a revenue neutral, cost neutral reform, you could give everyone relief at 30 percent. Given that you've got a 40 and a 20, but the people who are at 40, A, um, put shed loads of cash in, and basically that's why the average, the weight, although there's more at 20, the amount of cash going at 40 offsets that. But, but there's an interesting little tweak on that, which is salary sacrifice. People say to their employer, actually, I won't put any money into my pension. You put all of it in, and that's a bit of pay that you never get. And that saves the employer over time. If you fix tax relief, you probably wouldn't, wouldn't have those kind of arrangements, I suspect. And that gives the government extra money. So it might be that the cost-neutral rate of tax relief isn't 30, say, it could be 33. And if it's 33, that would be quite interesting, wouldn't it? Because you'd be able to say to the public who don't understand tax relief and don't see it and aren't incentivized to save by it, for every two pounds you put in a pension, the government will put in one. That might, because I don't believe tax relief incentivizes saving other than amongst the very rich at the moment. But um, that might actually have some impact. I think I could sell that. So that's just a thought, but I think somebody's going to have to grasp that, and probably um, my junior minister in the ministry will take that on. <laughs> um, so we need to sort tax relief out. Um, we need to sort out um, exactly how the new budget freedoms will land. Obviously, we'll be in place for April. Things will start then, but that's not that's the start of the journey. It's not the end of the journey. So what does that new world look like? Once we've seen what people do in reaction, what new products do we need? What new products will the industry bring forward? How the hell do we regulate them? Because people say to me, well. Shouldn't we have a charge cap on day one of these new products? It's like, but what would it be? How would you pick a charge cap? You know, what, what's the right charge for a drawdown product? I mean, does they're not look the same? So on day one, you, I don't think you can, but there might come a time when it's pretty clear what, what are the main sorts of products, how the market's working, whether the market's working, whether there's enough shopping around, and all the rest of it. You might <clears throat> think about how you regulate it, if at all, at that point. And so again, that's something that would have to be looked at. Um, there, there is so much more. If you, if you, I should have said, if you, if you do reform tax relief in the way I described, one of the great simplifications is you could abolish the lifetime limit. Because once people are getting fair amounts of in-year tax relief, you don't need to keep 40 years of records to make sure they haven't filled their boots for their entire life. And, and I get the sense that that would be a massive simplification and would be welcomed. Um, and actually, I think, I think lifetime limits don't, as a liberal, lifetime limits don't work for me because what they say is not that you... Not simply that you can't, you know, if you save beyond this level, you don't get any more tax relief. But if you save beyond this level or your investments grow beyond this level, we will actually penalise you. We will actually apply penal taxation. And that doesn't seem not. So getting rid of the lifetime limit would be a bonus. And there are those who say that lifetime limits keep bosses out of pension funds because they've used up their lifetime limit. If bosses, use a phrase, could be back in pension funds because they've got a year's worth of tax relief to benefit from, wouldn't we get better workplace pensions if the bosses were back in the workplace scheme? It, it, it could actually be a very positive thing. Um, I think given the temperature, in a moment I'm going to stop, uh, not least to, to hear from my, my colleagues, but particularly to hear from all of you. 
There's a whole raft of things we need to sort out in, in the next parliament in the in the pension sphere. Okay, I said it's not enough. The implementation of the charge gap, the use of the pension, the budget of freedoms, and all the rest of it. <laughs> <That's a fire laughs> um, but my central point today is that if you're going to see the whole person and not just a silo, the current structure of government doesn't work. It doesn't work for old people, it doesn't work for tomorrow's old people. You've got to bring all these things together, break down some departmental barriers, and then I think some quite innovative and creative things could be done. So in the unlikely event that I find myself in the same position after May the 7th, I think it'd be fair to say that my intro isn't quite empty. Just to thank you. Cool. minutes and not have any script to contribute, which is very unusual for a government minister and extremely refreshing. So now we're going to have Chris okay. Curry. I'll go around. Give his take <coughs> in this sauna. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I will speak quickly for five minutes and I can take my jacket off after that and it will be slightly cooler. Uh, it's always a blessing and a curse following Steve. Blessing because it's always interesting, engaging. I don't think anyone can make Pensions as engaging, even to self-confess, and I think the technical term is pension anoraks. Uh, <laughs> uh, so it's always a pleasure to listen to him, always slightly concerning because he's probably covered off as much as I could possibly ever think of doing anyway. But there are a couple of things uh, that I'd like to, to talk about. A brief today was to reflect on Steve's speech, bring out a couple of points, and then think about future policy options. Uh, firstly, to reflect on the speech, so two things. One, I very, very rarely get to do this, but I'd like to actually correct something which Steve said. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the, the report on the self-employed was actually by the Pension Provision Group. Nah. And, the group. <laughs> 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 and the Pension Provision Group are very close to my heart. They were the, the organisation that actually set up the Pensions Policy Institute. So it was obviously a very good report. <laughs> uh, also, I'm sure I heard you say, I'm not sure whether you meant to say, it's something about taking the P out of DWP. And I thought that had been a treasury occupation. <laughs> <laughs> but let's move on to some of the policy uh, issues. Uh, now, the thing that, that, that has struck me uh, throughout this, this parliament, I think about what this is going to mean for the next five years or so, is that actually even if Steve does get his wish, if there is this uh, super minister set up across the department, Minister of Pension Aging, if they suddenly find themselves in difficulty, Say, for example, they can't get a majority for a vote in the House of Commons or something, or the House of Lords is against them, and they can't actually do anything at all for the next five years. There's still going to be tremendous change coming through based on what's already gone through Parliament. Uh, so, if you just list kind of, I was just kind of jotting them down as Steve was talking about them, what's, what's been happening and what will happen. So, we've got probably one of the biggest things, which is probably slightly undersold, but the state pension reform coming in from April 2016 will have a massive impact, not just on the people who are part of the new system, but how the system, the state pension system interacts with uh, private pension, automatic enrolment, and everything on top of that. Very fundamental for one of the very few ones I can think of that means kind of within 10 years, everything that went before that in, in, the, in the pension system will not apply to people coming up. To We're very good at building layer upon layer of complexity. That's not there in this new state pension reform. So that coming in in April 2016 is going to be quite a big thing anyway for the people reaching state pension age after that time. There's also state pension age itself. We know that the first review uh, of state pension age uh, involving the government access department and an independent reviewer or review group uh, will be has to report by 2017. So there will be more announcements around what's going to happen to state pension age and the speed at which that's going to increase in the future. Uh, we talked about automatic enrolment. Uh, it's always very easy to forget we're still only halfway through into actually implementing automatic enrolment uh, and we've still got by far the vast majority of employers in this country to go through the process, even though in terms of the number of individuals, we've covered probably more than half of them by now. In terms of employers, we've got a long way further to go. So there's still going to be uh, a lot of action around that in terms of seeing how that goes with all <coughs> employers, seeing if there's any uh, potential need uh, to help them in, in implementation and seeing what difference it has on the employees of those employees compared to the big schemes and what happens. And then we get re-enrollment and everything carries on again. So there's a lot going on in the workplace space as well, without even thinking about governance, charges, all these kind of technical issues which we tend to gloss over when we think about the big policy picture, but which are very important in determining how much people have uh, to, to live on. Uh, 
Then we get the bit which is probably not quite within Steve's remit, but is but is still very important. Uh, freedom of choice and the changes announced in the budget. Uh, they come in from April this year, but I think what we'll see is that policy is not going to stand still all the way that policy uh, affects individuals is not going to be the same at the start of the parliament as it is at the end of the parliament, mainly because the individuals coming through are going to be very different in five years' time from what's going through the process now. So again, that's something which is going to have to be kept under review. It's going to have to be monitored to see how it's working, what people are doing, how well people are understanding and coping with the system. Ten and fifteen years' time, actually, the system is, is. And on top of all that, there's still the possibility there could be new types of pension schemes being set up in the next parliament. When we have uh, the pensions bill going through at the moment, it becomes a pensions act. The possibility of defining our vision, collective defined contribution schemes, <coughs> which may be set up during the next parliament, seeing how they work and how that goes goes further all the way through. So even if there's no new policy announcements at all, we're still in for a very busy five years no matter what happens. Uh, having said that, the area that I would pick up where there probably is likely to be is still in the same area that the, 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 the 46 years at the minimum contribution level, suggesting a median uh, maybe a one in four chance of being happy with their means that that's pretty more earnings now. Seeing that's very much a start of the process, and it's very. Thank you very much, Chris, and congratulations on being the only person to find a mistake. That's uh, <laughs> Steve made a mistake. Um, Graham's up Still next. <laughs> Thank you, Becky, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I was going to focus my remarks on the challenges for the next pension minister, but um, having heard Steve earlier, I think it's kind of challenges for the next minister for everything. <laughs> um, you know, but the, 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 the kind of situation is the same, really. Wh whoever he or she is who, who picks up that huge portfolio come May or come June or come July, whenever it's clear, um, will inherit a quite fantastic legacy in many ways, I think. They'll inherit a state pension which people can understand. How novel is that? They'll understand that they'll inherit a increase in the number of people saving for their own retirement, the likes of which we haven't seen for at least a generation. And they'll inherit in freedom and choice uh, a rich potential to enable people to fund their retirement in ways which make sense for them. Not ways in which they're told to do, but ways in which makes sense for them. In doing that, though, I think they're going to face fairly quickly two pretty meaty challenges, which both Steve and um, Chris have already alluded to, really. The, the first is the question of whether all of those people who are saving, and many of them saving for the first time, whether they're saving enough. Uh, and the second one is whether when those people come to retirement, they're spending in ways which make sense. Not sense to politicians necessarily, but sense to those people themselves, and whether actually freedom and choice has its potential realized because as, as Chris said, what we see in April this year will be very, very different, I hope, to what we'll see throughout the course of next parliament in terms of the opportunities that are open to people. And the important thing about those challenges, I think, is they're critical they're, they're linked, they're inextricably linked. <coughs> because I think the solution to getting people to save more, as to some extent we are going to need to do is almost certain to lie in the relationship between employers and workers. In fact, just about every successful private pension initiative that's been undertaken in this country 
has taken place in that relationship between workers and employers. It's why automatic enrollment works, because both parties buy into the consent as it goes with the, the grain. Um, and I think both of those groups, workers and employers, will be looking at the rollout of freedom and choice and looking at how people actually use their pension income in future. The more successful freedom of choice is, the more people make decisions that are right for them and enable them to have the income and wealth balance throughout their retirement that's right for them, the more both workers and their employers are likely to say, yeah, we should think about contributing more, whether that's through auto-escalation or, or some other things. <coughs> and all of that, of course, makes me a big advocate for the type of joint <coughs> policy making that clearly you'll get in the Ministry for Everything. That's that's what it's all about. You, you can you can take the labour market, you can take pensions, you can take savings, you can take tax relief and care into consideration uh, in this new department. <coughs> I think that we also need something else. We also need uh, an independent voice and an independent view which helps that minister make the, the many, many decisions which she or he will, will have to make. Uh, and that's why the NAPF is calling for a retirement savings commission to, to guide the work of the next pensions minister or, or, or minister for everything, to, to make sure that pensions policy is built for the long term, not the parliamentary term, and that it takes into account the needs of savers across the board. And the policy is built on evidence, understanding, and independence. The good news, I think, about uh, that type of approach to policy making is there's plenty of precedents for it. So, for example, the last time we uh, met a new pensions minister back in 2010, I think, one of the first things he did was to introduce an independent review to understand how to make automatic enrollment work. The quality of that review group's report is one of the things that is uh, fundamental to the successful rollout of automatic enrollment that we've seen over the last five years. I think we need more of that independent input and insight in the next parliament. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nigel. Last but not least, the one we've all been waiting for. Oh, well, wait till you hear what I have to say. Um, <laughs> One of the great things about the British Constitution is it's not written down, it's evolved. And I think I've come to the conclusion that we now have a new bit of the British Constitution that just says that Steve Webb will be pensions minister. <laughs> so, uh, whatever happens after the election, I, I, I honestly think that kind of will go to Caxton House and it will still be there. Uh, and that wouldn't be a, a bad thing at all from a TUC point of view. I mean, he, I, I think it's, as we come to election, it is worth paying tribute to, to Steve that he has brought that kind of degree of consistency and innovation and consensus building to the work that work that he's he's done there. Um, and I think that's I think that's great. And I think that follows on from a pattern that had developed before. I mean I think one of the you know, it, it is the implementation of auto enrollment by this government is great success, but it was building on what went before. It was building on the work of the Pensions Commission, which is one of the most skillful bits of public policy making, I think. Not only were they experts, but they were very practical people who worked out what was possible. It was kind of, here is a solution which both works and has a degree of real politics to it that will mean it can survive different governments. The right got something, the left got something, employers got something, workers got something. They had that degree of consensus for it. And I, th I, I, I think that's great. Um, and I think one of the advantages of Steve's proposal, if we had a minister for everything, that we might have avoided a break with that in the budget, where out of nowhere came a non-consensus building, not thought through, no stakeholder engagement to uh, the decumulation process. I think that the kind of key starting point for the work of the Pensions Commission was that relying on individual self-reliance was not working. People were not saving, they were not making, they were not running the right internal discount rate to work out how much they should save uh, for that, because I think that people on the whole are very good at internal discount rates. Uh, and secondly, there was market failure. The market was simply not interested in the great majority of workers who didn't earn very much money. Um, and yet, the whole freedom and choice agenda, I heard the Chancellor say this, is based on the idea of market innovation and individual self-reliance. 
and I think that that is a recipe for it not working. Now, I think there are ways through that, and I think kind of uh, there seems to be an almost growing consensus, which may not may or may not include the Treasury now, that we need to revisit some of the approaches of the um, Pensions Commission to look at how we use defaults, how we look at inertia, mm -hmm. how we build institutions that ensure that employees get a good deal. Because I am very worried that the kind of people who will end up with modest pots will not have the right kind of uh, processes or um, <laughs> products or institutions that will look after their savings when they come to decumulate them. Um, uh, but I very much agree with Steve that we need to make those pots bigger in the first place. And I, I welcome very much what he had to say about um, auto-escalation, including contributions. Although I did find a mistake in what he said there as well. Because I, I don't think it's right to talk about 8% contributions. Because I think that underplays the role of the band of earnings. You only get contributions. I'm, Steve will know the lower earnings there, which I've completely <laughs> forgotten. But it's, I can still think of it as a bit above five, a bit above five thousand. It's, it's got, it's gone up. And the, and again, the uh, the uh, the the trigger that gets you into auto enrolment, which has gone up, I think, enough, far too high. That's been linked to the uh, uh, to the personal income tax alliance. Whether you think that's a good policy or not, I think it's a bad policy. But. Uh, the auto enrolment trigger has gone up because every time it goes up, more and more part-time women workers don't get to start saving in a in, in, in a pension scheme, and I think that's I think that's a mistake. And I think also there are other changes in the labour market as well, which were, which were which the pensions commission could not have foreseen. Uh, which um, I think we've talked about self-employment, but we've also got the growth of people with multiple jobs. And I remember spending a long time talking to officials about. What do you do with people with multiple jobs? That their income taken together would trigger contributions, but because they're in different jobs. And it, it, in the end, they persuaded me it was in the too difficult box and it simply wasn't possible to do anything um, without starting from scratch and it was too late from that. And you'd have to use HMRC data in ways that no one wanted HMRC data to be, to be used, although um, the HMRC don't seem to be very good at anything very much at the moment, okay. so um, that's a good decision. But uh, I think there is something something there that we need to do. So I think in terms of the accumulation phase, what we need to do is to increase contributions, but we also need to start more people contributing. I, I'm increasingly attracted by the idea of getting at least employers to contribute from the first pound of earnings in every job. Uh, you could even reduce the percentage to start off with, so it wasn't a huge step change in the total amount for that. Because I think that covers an awful lot of the of the of, 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 of the problems. Um, having said that, I think that there is still a huge amount to do. Uh, I agree very much with Graham about um, about uh, having more independent, and I'd very much like to see a new pensions commission to look at decumulation and get that right. Thanks. <laughs> So we have 32 minutes for questions, and I imagine that everybody's got one. <laughs> <laughs> 32 minutes gone. Yeah. But I have the right to ask the first question of the chair, and I'm interested to know in this room, does everybody know what their state pension age will be when they get to that moment? Yeah. And do you think all your friends and family know? No. <laughs> Because I find it very worrying how many of our readers at the Sunday Times are not clear when they're going to retire. Um, and I question that the gov.uk website is as clear as it could be on this subject. <laughs> anyway, I'm glad you all know. <laughs> so, first question goes to Louise Eccles from the Daily Mail. Thank you. And um, Stephen, if even the pensions minister can be targeted by fraudsters by a text message, and how concerned are you that there'll be a flood of these kind of scams in the lead up or off the back of the pension yeah. um, reforms? Sure. Do you want to do one at a time or do you want to respond to me? Yeah, yeah. Just um, yeah, yeah I, I entirely agree. Um, you know, people are going to have access to an awful lot of cash, and wherever there is cash, there are crooks. Uh, and funnily enough, our, our sense of this is that they're not pensions crooks, they're just crooks, you know, and they just happen to have alighted here, and as we see them off here, they'll go somewhere else. So it, it, it's a big issue. Um, there's a huge amount going on, and, and it's one of these frustrating ones where, you know, 
Um, there's more going on than we're able to say, obviously, because we don't want the bad guys to know what we're up to. Um, but but buyer awareness is really very important. So the PensionWise website is on the front being aware of scams. The, so, for example, everybody who's registered on the website already uh, is getting an email telling them about, about the website, and it specifically says, and how to avoid scams. So I think you colleagues in the media have a huge role to play. You know, Of course, we will do what we can to drive out the crooks and to spot them and to act and so on, but you will never be always ahead of the game, and we need everybody to realize that there are an awful lot of people out there who want to take your money and not do very good things with it. I think there's a I think there's an issue that um, there's kind of there's two there's two ways of kind of looking at people being ripped off. There's one kind of illegal ways of ripping off, yeah. and I think that's right. But I'm also worried that people will be ripped off perfectly legally by products which are perfectly legal but offer such poor value and so inappropriate to them, but they won't um, they they will just do very badly from them. And I think that's a downside of um, of, of of freedom and choice and. People are free to make mistakes, I know, but making catastrophic errors that affect you for the rest of your life strikes me as a dangerous bit of public policy making. Also, Steve, the Pension Wise website, which I know is not sadly your responsibility, but will it have a tax calculator on it so people can actually understand how much tax they'll pay if they withdraw money? It explains the tax implications of what you're doing quite explicitly. There's big sort of exclamation marks and think about the tax, think about the tax. So whilst it obviously can't take account of everyone's complete circumstances and do their income tax returns for them, it, you know, the tax implications of what you do is a big feature of the site. Lynn? Um, yes, we have more morning. Lynn Burnham from Mothers at Home Matter. Um, how do you propose to safeguard those mothers and more and more, in fact, indeed now, uh, fathers who take time out of their careers to care for their family and extended family, indeed, because we're talking about the sandwich generation here. Because many of these parents will have been in a household where the breadwinner earns more than £60,000 and therefore does not qualify for child benefit anymore. Is it's the when um, you get your national insurance co insurance contributions paid until your youngest child is twelve? So how are we going to guarantee that those carers, be it mum or dad, continues to get their uh, uh, contributions paid? Because a lot of new mothers and fathers are coming into the system, and I know this from our from our membership. They're not actually registering because they think, oh well, I can't qualify for child benefit. I'm not going to register. You've got a huge issue coming up here. Sure. Uh, no, it's an important point and it's one I've looked into. So um, for people who are already in the child benefit system and who then the high earning rule comes in, um, as long as they have an underlying entitlement to child benefit, even if they're not getting a penny in payment, still get the credits. So you don't have to receive any child benefit to get, to, to get the credits. So the people who are already in the system uh, are, are pretty much okay as far as we can see. You raise an important point about the, you know, for instance, the woman with the well-off husband who has her first child. Um, the bounty pack that new mums get uh, should have information about this. And I've been asking HMRC for data on the number of women get, or the number of, actually the number of people getting this protection, and it hasn't fallen. So I looked for the date when the thing changed and, and did it fall off a cliff, and it, it hasn't, but I agree we have to be vigilant because it is an entitlement, even if you're, you know, your husband's rich, you don't actually get a penny of child benefit. Oh, but can, can I just stop there? We're not rich earning sixty thousand pounds. Or richer. No, because if you've got two people earning thirty thousand pounds, double income families bringing in sixty thousand, you will still qualify for child benefit. Yeah. So what this government, what this coalition has done, has been detrimental to the one earner family. So please don't call us rich. We're not rich. Well, re relative to most people, sixty thousand is rich. Thank you very much, Steve. Of course, uh, sorry, Angus Hampton, Intergenerational Foundation. Um, thank you very much, Steve, with uh, extremely entertaining um, speak, speech and very um, informative. Of course, we welcome the auto enrolment moves, as ever, presumably everyone in this room does, and the improvement to the state pension for particularly for poorer people. But we worry, as you know, about intergenerational fairness and whether you're being really fair on the younger and future generations in particular um, two questions one 
the pen unfunded pension liability. I don't think you really monitor it well enough. I mean, perhaps you'd like to give us a view on what it is. The last figure that I saw, and there's very little done on it, was 3.8 trillion. Um, and I think that's an understatement for a couple of technical reasons and, and life expectancies. And I think that's really important for the younger generation, but that is monitored probably more so than the debt, which is about a quarter of that, which is the, the official government debt. Um, and secondly, um, I'd like to ask you about this early release. I guess, do you know what? Funds. We should have very, to one question. Very quick question. Though. The it has to be very funds, quick. Would you, would you have allowed the early release of funds, which was announced in the autumn statement, personally, uh, at 55, to get hold of your pension fund? Are you talking about the budget changes? Yeah. Okay. Um, the, the intergenerational aspects of what's been going on lately, as, as you will appreciate, are much more subtle than people think. So people say, you only, you know, old people are the only people who vote, you shovel money at the grave, vote, it's terrible. And then you stand in front of a group of pensioners who are deeply aggrieved and feel that we've let them down. Now, how do you reconcile those two? Well, part of it is if you think about the big focus for income tax cuts in this parliament, getting a tax allowance from 6,500 to 10,000, something the Lib Dems have pushed for, that in the leaders' debates in 2010, David Cameron looked mockingly at Nick Clegg and said, don't you see, Nick, you couldn't possibly do it, has cost a shed load of cash, and all of that cash has gone to the working age, whereas pensioners have had their tax allowances frozen. Likewise, interest rate policy. You know, the lowest interest rates in living memory <coughs> over a long period, who does it benefit? Working age borrowers, who does it hit? Retired savers. So whilst there are other things we've obviously done for pensions, the triple lock and all the rest of it, in terms of this generation, it's much more subtle and mixed, I think. You raise a perfectly fair point, the unfunded liabilities will have to be paid by the next generation and beyond. That's one of the reasons why we've linked state pension age to longevity, so that instead of keeping the pension age where it is and saying to tomorrow's workers, you've just got to pay sky high taxes to pay for the retired population, we've, we're going to have a process that says two thirds of your adult life in work, one third in retirement, give or take, and that tries to keep the burden on, on whichever working age population we're talking about sustainable. Um, would, I, would I have allowed uh, the um, budget changes? I mean, I helped to write some of them, so yes. <laughs> Question from the gentleman there. Thank you. Uh, Francis McGee, I'm from Step Change, the debt charity. Um, uh, just to build on um, the point about seeing the whole person, um, a lot of people have liabilities as well as assets. Um, so two immediate joined up government challenges and one longer term one, if I may. The two immediate ones were, were five different ministries not responsible for personal debt? I somehow doubt that the insolvency service would be, as we speak, dismantling some of the protections for pension assets in personal insolvency. Um, and, and secondly, the question of people retiring with debts, be they mortgage debts or whatever, is an immediate, not a longer term challenge for the pension guidance system, which it seems ill prepared to handle. And the longer term challenge is debt prevention. So just to add it to the list for auto enrolment, how about having a system where the first so many pounds of uh, accumulated asset is in a rainy day uh, liquid savings pot uh, to preserve people from the short term income knocks that you know, got debts when they retire. It's, thank you. Question, Steve seems, if somebody, could the next person ask somebody other than Steve? <laughs> <laughs> it, yeah, it's just briefly, Francis, all, all very sensible points, I think. As, as you say, we do have fragmentation. So like the DWP has actually been doing some quite good stuff on credit units, for example, and, and I think I saw a figure of, you know, a million more or whatever the number was, people in credit units, which has got to be a good thing. But it's, it tends to be a bit on the edges of what the department does, although all the universal credit stuff and budgeting and all of that is trying to be more holistic about all of that. But, you know, I agree, doing it in one place would, would make a lot of sense. Um, people retiring with debts, indeed, I mean, we, we have an issue that uh, growing numbers of people on pension credit have a mortgage and probably a mortgage they will never pay off. So whereas in the past, you know, paying mortgage interest on benefit was a sort of temporary thing while you'd lost your job, this could now run for decades. And there's a bit of an issue for us, for the taxpayer about that. Um, the budget freedoms to a point could help. I think some people will say, actually, that, that bit of capital is not going to make a life-changing difference if I turn it into income, but will clear my debts. And this is financial advice, but, you know, and I think that will actually 
be a, a godsend for some people. That will really be what they want to do. And given the interest rates they might be paying, it might be a far better return than other things they could do. You know? So I think that may help a bit. But as you say, ultimately, trying to prevent it in the first place. Bit nervous of kind of carving up auto enrollment. I mean, because it's worked so well as a structure, there's a queue outside my door if people want to do things with it. So I've noted that one. <laughs> Now, we haven't had many questions from the back, so I'm going to take the gentleman standing up there. Please. Uh, Philip Rush from the world. Uh, lots of interesting proposals uh, have around uh, future things for uh, whoever uh, comes in next uh, in the project. But uh, there's not always a consensus around the reports, and uh, if it is someone else other than yourself, um, which of the reformers are you all? concerned about that might get rolled back or uh, reformed uh, in an adverse way? Steve's not allowed to answer that question. <laughs> uh, Chris, do you want to have a go? Uh, we could ask Steve again. Uh, but, I mean, as I was saying, I think when I was speaking earlier, w one of the, the issues is, is that, that, and as Steve alluded to as well, it takes a long time for pension reforms, even when they're on the books, to actually start to come in and input an impact on people's lives. Uh, and we've seen that over the, over the years. I mean, I think even in the short lifetime of the Pensions Policy Institute, there's been seven or eight different state pension reforms uh, happening, which means that the rules change <laughs> each year. Uh, we had some sort of, of a very strange situation where uh, first you had to have 39 qualifying years and it went down to 30. Now it's going back into 35 all over uh, I think a six year <laughs> period for qualification. So it, it's really difficult for people to understand. I'm not sure, given that, that there is still consensus around most of the policies which have been introduced in this coalition government, I mean the state pension, state pension age increasing, automatic enrolment. I think there are some concerns about automatic enrolment and I know that in the past there's been some talk about whether or not the very small employers should be part of automatic enrolment or whether they should be exempt because it's too difficult for them to do as a business. Uh, there's been much less talk of that recently but I guess the way in which the staging is working means there's still a potential for something like that for automatic enrolment to be changed before it gets rolled out all the way through there. I'd hope that we could try and guard against that to at least get everybody in before we start talking about changes to it. Uh, the area where there's been least agreement, I think, is on the, the, the budget changes and freedom and choice. Uh, although I think to borrow an analogy from a, a, a colleague of mine, it's a bit like a tube of toothpaste. Now you've squeezed all the toothpaste out, it's very, very difficult to get it back in the tube. So I can't see there being much scope for there being reform in the short term to try and undo some of those changes. That's not to say the policy won't evolve over time and there might be different things added. And if you look internationally, it's very interesting to see the direction of policy in many other countries where they, they have, for example, very little in the way of use of annuities and longevity insurance are now starting to, to think about how they can use behavioural theory to get people to do more of that, whereas we've just moved completely the opposite direction. So there's, there's policy there, but I can't see there's much prospect of many of the big strands actually being being reversed in the next parliament. Thank you. Another question from the back, gentlemen sitting down. Uh, Steve Lowe from Just Retirement. I'll try and bring uh, Graham and uh, Nigel in if I may. Um, John Hutton <coughs> made a keynote speech yesterday, and one of the things he said was he had a concern that um, the pension freedom and choice might have distracted us from what is the core need of a pension, that is to generate an income for people in retirement. Mm -hmm. And conference was looking at um, what's going to happen 10 or 20 years out. I just wonder whether Graham and Nigel had any concerns that we have become a little bit fixated about capital values, asset volatility, and less actually about the pension income, which is what these things were originally designed for. Yeah, uh, great, great question. Thank you. Um, I, I think it, it has distracted us. It's distracted the sort of people who get together in these rooms <coughs> and, and talk about these sort of issues. I'm not so sure that it's distracted the actual people who will be seeking to get their money out. So, so when, we, when we do research with the, the baby boomers who are coming up to this kind of decision point, around about 80% of them tell us the most important thing for them is a regular guaranteed income stream. That they, they want that longevity protection, they want that certainty. And, and so picking up on some of the points that Chris was making about the, the evolution of freedom and choice, into the next parliament. I think it's really important that government and industry work together in a way which, which frankly they haven't done over the last year to make sure that solutions are being developed which capture that fundamental desire for an income that lasts through retirement but also adds on 
some of the benefits that I think are available from freedom of choice, like a bit more flexibility, perhaps early in retirement, perhaps a bit more choice about how long and where you keep your money invested for. But I think the distraction that you mentioned it, it is real, but it's confined to largely to a group of people who talk about pensions rather than people who actually have them. I'm not sure I'm as um, as uh, confident as that. I, I think the budget reforms, the great danger is that they throw out the risk-sharing baby with the annuity market failure bathwater. Although I absolutely take the toothpaste now, you can't put it back in. I mean, if you ask people what they want, at the moment they say they want an index-linked annuity. Do they buy an index-linked annuity? No, they don't. So I'm not sure that asking people what they want is a successful predictor of the way that they will navigate their way through this incredibly scary multiple choice world where they will have be getting all kinds of conflicting messages about, about, about what they should be doing. Um, I think that that is why we need to think about how do we build defaults into the retirement process. And I think that has to be around at least longevity sharing not necessarily traditional annuities with guarantees in because guarantees are expensive. I think there are better risk sharing ways of providing some predictability about income. Uh, but you also have to deal with the, uh, the, the real difficulties as well, that there's an awful lot of people who simply don't have enough money for many of the traditional for profit providers to be that interested in. And I think you're going to need something that is either Nest or looks a lot like Nest to run decumulation for low to medium as well and that is the, a gaping gap in the post-retirement landscape. Um, um, I, I think the side, uh, side is building defense from the Fawcett Society. I think the side of socialization <laughs> comment... That's another new word, thank you. <laughs> well, I, <laughs> a new one on me. It's very interesting because of course even if you put that group of um, uh, structures together, then you siloize against another set of structures. And I'm quite interested in, are there bigger solutions to this that are outside the pensions box? And one I, I think it, uh, I would counsel you to look at is considering the length of the working week. We used to have a six day working week, we now have a five day working week. And for the society that we live in now, a four day working week might become better, particularly if we could stick with the same salary for four as we do for, for five. We have all sorts of benefits, particularly making people feel more like working for longer and making that a reasonable thing to do over a working um, life. But actually, to deal with the salarization issue, I think the most important thing, and I'm not sure I'm clear about it, is what vision are we all heading for? Because if all of the government departments share a common vision, then we're much more likely to get them all to act in line with it. And then just one very quick thing, if I may, small thing to you, big thing to lots of people, women particularly in their 50s have found their retirement age changed rapidly with very little notice. Some of them have had only 18 months notice or so of it. And this is really causing problems. And, and we're being, Forza Society is being hugely lobbied to ask you to make some changes to that, to stop <coughs> disadvantaging that particular group of women who've got no chance of getting themselves into a state where they're going to have enough to live on. Very good point. Um, what did you say to that, Steve? Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, I, I certainly agree that the labour market is key. I, I can't see us getting firms to pay people for four days' work, but what they pay them for five. But I do think that flexible, flexible working is a big step forward. So, for example, We've, we've abolished the default retirement age, so you can't be forced out just for turning an age. We've given everybody a legal right to request flexible working, and although people say, oh, it's only a right to request, actually four out of five requests for flexible working are granted. So actually, most people who ask flexible working get it. And the bit that I missed out of what I said, really, and again, tends to be a bit of a Cinderella bit of our department, but is vital, is the fuller working lives issue. Because how are you gonna square all this? If people aren't saving enough, uh, and we don't want them to be poor in retirement, working for longer, but not necessarily doing five days a week, heavy manual work till you're 75. You know, there is, there is a, a, a rethinking later working life and Ros Altman, who's our business champion for all the work, is doing a great job on that. So that's part of the, again, back to my theory of everything, part of the pensions mix is sorting out the labor market in, late, in later life. On your specific issue about women's state pension age, so um, 
I would accept that women born in 54 have had a very substantial increase in their state pension age, most of which legislated for 20 years ago, and they didn't know, weren't told. So, you know, 95 Pension Act takes a woman who is uh, born in 54 and makes her state pension age 64, as near as damn it. And, and because she was 40 odd at the time, she wasn't reading articles about pensions, the government of the time didn't tell her. So she gets to 60 or something, expects to get a state pension, and it turns out that her state pension age had already gone up by four years and nobody told her. We've added a maximum of 18 months, uh, 18 months is 18 months, but every woman whose state pension age we have increased qualifies for the new single tier pension, every woman. And those women on average gain an extra nine pound a week in their pension for the rest of their retirement. So on average, that 18 months they've lost more than offset for most of them, not all of them, most of them, by the better state pension for women. So, you know, has it been quicker than I would have liked? Yes, yes, it has. Should we have done, should previous governments particularly have done more? Because we wrote to everybody. The reason I get the flack is I told them. If you'd been in power, would you have not